To buy a transmission that can handle 650 horsepower is going to cost me over $7,000, or I can build it and save about three grand. Well, let's see if I can successfully rebuild a transmission. This is part two of a two-part series. In the previous episode, I drove out to Utah for a collaboration with Power Driven Diesel. I personally purchased all the engine parts for the upgrade to the engine. Before the upgrades, the truck was very close to just over 17 seconds to accelerate from zero to 60 miles per hour, which is awful. I repeated the same test towing a 10,000 pound trailer and it took over 45 seconds to reach 60 miles per hour. With all the engine upgrades, the transmission began slipping badly on the dyno at just over 400 horsepower. So now the engine is way too powerful for the transmission and it needs to be built to handle all the extra power. Upgrading the engine and not the transmission is a very common mistake that a lot of people make. So let's remove the original transmission and rebuild it to handle 650 horsepower and over 1300 foot-pounds of torque. I don't have a car lift and I'm used to rolling around on the ground on my back for a job like this. And Reed and Levi are making this look way too easy. The drive shaft and carrier bearing are loose. The transmission pan is off and there's definitely some metal in the pan after the 400 horsepower run. And the transmission jack is in place. In order to remove the cross member under the transmission, a jack is used to spread the frame. And the transmission and transfer case are both out of the vehicle in about an hour and 15 minutes. By the way, Levi and Reed are both under the age of 25, and it's great to see young guys with so much talent. The flex plate attaches to the back of the motor and transfers power directly to the transmission. The original flex plate weighs 6.81 pounds and is definitely not designed to handle more than 500 horsepower. And the new flex plate is made of billet steel, which is substantially stronger, and it weighs almost twice as much at 12.6 pounds. It's designed for around 2,000 horsepower, which should be plenty for future engine upgrades. The torque converter transfers power from the flex plate to the transmission. The original torque converter the weighs 55.7 pounds and the high performance torque converter weighs 63.8. Near the end of this video, we'll cut open this torque converter and then we'll compare it against a triple disc high performance torque converter. If you've taken the time to remove the transmission, it's a really good idea to replace the rear oil seal, especially on an older vehicle. The power driven diesel team has a special tool for installing the seal, but a piece of wood and a hammer can also work just fine. The team at Power Driven Diesel has a very professional setup for rebuilding transmissions, but I've asked to not use it. Instead, I want to do a rebuild as a DIY project just like a wood at home. Let's go ahead and remove the transmission pan and take a look inside. The magnet inside the transmission pan could be worse, but there is quite a bit of metal on the magnet. Let's go ahead and remove the valve body on the transmission so we can get to the internals of the transmission. So what exactly does a valve body do? The valve body controls the flow of transmission fluid to various components to facilitate gear shifting. To remove the valve body on a 47RE transmission, it's pretty critical to assist the transmission harness in sliding out of the transmission or to likely break when removing the valve body. I'll rotate the output shaft just a little in order to free up the linkage. Let's go ahead and remove the accumulator spring and the accumulator. We're going to replace the plastic accumulator with one made of billet. The plastic has a total of two seals and the billet has four seals. Let's go ahead and remove the second gear band. We'll first have to loosen the three quarter inch band adjustment nut on the opposite side of the transmission. I went ahead and removed the adjustment nut and the second gear band anchor is coming out and the billet one is going back in. I'll slide the strut out from under the groove and I'll also remove the anchor. So why replace these with billet steel? The factory strut bends under the high line pressure from the new valve body and the anchor will sometimes split. So let's replace these with billet replacement parts. Let's first remove the six bolts that hold the transmission pump in place. The pump has two threaded holes. Installing a couple of carriage bolts into these threaded holes really helps for removing the pump from the housing. I'll use a claw hammer to apply leverage to extract the pump. I'll use a pry bar and apply force to the sun shell to remove the input shaft. For now, I'll wait to rebuild each of the components one at a time. I want to first remove all the internals from inside the transmission case. Now's a good time to remove the second gear band. Since I bought the 1996 Ram 16 years ago, I've adjusted the transmission band a couple of times to ensure proper tension. And the transmission band is not damaged and still looks good. The original second gear band is on the table and the replacement is on top. The new band has a lot more surface area and is designed for more durability. Let's go ahead and remove the Mickey Mouse washer and the steel spacer. As you can see, there's quite a bit of wear on the washer and the copper is coming through. Now let's go ahead and remove the planetary assembly. There's an easier way to do this, but I'll do it the hard way to ensure that we get a good look at the action. Let's go ahead and remove the second gear lever. I'll go ahead and remove the plug which locks the lever pin into position. It really helps to use needle nose pliers to slide the pin towards the front of the transmission. And a second gear lever is out. It's a 3.8 ratio made of cast and is being replaced by a 4.2 ratio lever made of billet. So the new second gear lever has a mechanical advantage over the original one and it's made of much stronger material. Let's remove the second gear servo next. There's a snap ring that needs to be removed. A nice little tap with a screwdriver and the servo cover is out. So why replace the servo cover? The bore at the very center of the servo begins to wear and leak over time and this prevents a clean second gear release. In other words, a worn and leaky servo causes a bind during the second to third gear shift. I'll place some shop towel 
files on the table since we're about to make a mess. I'll go ahead and remove the second gear servo. This specific part does cause a lot of performance problems, but the replacement part is the solution. Let's go ahead and remove the lower reverse drum. There's a snap ring that's holding it in place that's about to take flight. And the low reverse drum and the low reverse band are out of the transmission. It's a good idea to check the drum for hot spots and gouges. This one is still in good condition. I didn't have any previous issues with reverse and the band and the drum still look great. A plug transmission filter will prevent proper lubrication of the inner bore and cause damage. The inner bore still looks good on this transmission. So these parts can be reused. Removing the sprag assembly can be a little bit tricky. If force is applied to one of the rollers, the rollers can pop out of position easily. The good news is that the rebuild kit does include a new sprag. Let's remove the output shaft speed sensor next. It's a Hallfax sensor, so the end of the sensor is magnetized and this one has collected a small amount of metal. The overdrive unit on a 47RE is mounted on the tail end of the transmission. So let's go ahead and separate it from the main part of the transmission case. The overdrive selector spacing fell out when I removed the tail housing, but here's where the spacer belongs. The spacer is not a wear item and it will be reused. The overdrive piston is coming out. When you lose overdrive, usually this seal tears and causes galling. It commonly burns up the clutch below it as well. Let's also check for galling on the inner bore. The mating surfaces on the overdrive piston is also free of galling. If there's minor galling, it can be cleaned up with scotch brite or sandpaper. Let's remove the six bolts that are holding the overdrive piston support in place. The drum rides on the aluminum, and this one is still in good condition. There's another pin that needs to be removed. Let's go ahead and disassemble the low reverse servo. Once the snap ring is removed, let's remove the cover and the spring, and then the servo itself. Typically, the servo holds up well, so we'll go ahead and reuse it. We'll reinstall new seals during the reassembly. Let's remove the neutral safety switch next. All the parts have been stripped off the transmission case. The transmission case will be cleaned up off camera, so we can have a clean case for reassembly. Let's remove the snap ring from the front of the overdrive unit, so we can remove the overdrive brake clutch. If the overdrive is slipping, this is probably where you'll find the problem. The reaction plate usually does not experience damage and this one still looks good. All of the clutches are still in good condition without any hot spots. This is a part that came out of another transmission and it has very noticeable hot spots. We still have two more snap rings to remove before we can extract the overdrive unit internals. One of the two rings is wavy and it's designed to act as a spring to cushion the overdrive shift so it doesn't hit so violently. Unfortunately, it is prone to breaking. So we'll go ahead and throw this one out and replace it with an extra clutch in its place. Let's remove the Torrington bearing and we'll check it for bluing or overheating. This bearing is engaged the entire time the transmission is engaged in overdrive drive which puts a lot of stress on it. The spring underneath this bearing takes about 850 pounds to compress. So this is a very durable bearing. If you're rebuilding the 47RE transmission, it really helps to dig the grit out of these two T25 screws or they'll end up stripping out. There's a snap ring under the overdrive cover plate that needs to be removed in order for final disassembly of the overdrive unit. And a snap ring is out and it actually looks pretty good. Sometimes this snap ring experiences a lot of wear and it loses quite a bit of material. If there is a lot of material loss, recommend replacing the snap ring with a new one. While the overdrive case is getting cleaned up off camera, let's go ahead and rebuild the sub-assemblies one at a time. This will help prevent confusion and help us avoid making mistakes during the rebuild process. There are three main shafts in this transmission as well as a pump. The output shaft, input shaft, and the intermediate shaft. Let's split this assembly into two pieces and I'll set aside the third gear direct drum for about a minute while we rebuild the input shaft assembly. Let's replace the input shaft with one that's made of billet that can handle almost twice as much torque. What's very interesting is that this billet shaft has a 40 thousandths of an inch hole. It's a proprietary lube modification that feeds oil into third gear clutch to eliminate hot spots and cool the clutch. The bottom line is that this modification tremendously increases third gear clutch life. Let's free up the clutch pack and we'll take a look at their condition. And all of the components are showing minor wear and tear, but we're going to replace these parts anyway. Let's free up the input shaft and install a new billet shaft. And the entire drum slides off the input shaft. Let's remove the piston from the input shaft. There are two seals that we need to replace. And it's time to dig into our TransTech rebuild kit. Both the old seal and the new seal have a lip and the lip is oriented towards the pressure. Installing the large outer seal can easily be done by hand with without use of a pick or any other tool. Using a pick makes very easy work of extracting the old seal. Let's replace the inner seal next. And once again, the lip of the seal is oriented towards the pressure. I'll add some automatic transmission into a tray that we can use to lubricate parts and seals during the assembly process. Let's install three seals on the new billet input shaft. It's pretty easy to slide the two smaller seals into position. The larger seal has to be unlocked before installation, but it is pretty easy to lock once it's in position. Let's slide the drum over top of the input shaft. Part of the transmission case has been cleaned up and I'll use it to hold the input shaft as we reassemble everything into the forward drum. It really helps to lubricate the seals with fresh automatic transmission fluid before reassembly. I'll use a pick to get the seal started, but you can also use a slotted screwdriver. The rebuild kit includes two style of springs. So I'm going to replace the old and tired looking spring with one that looks the same. 
The plastic spacer is then placed on top of the spring. I'll go ahead and install the wavy snap ring on top of the spacer. A screwdriver can help fully seat the spring into the groove. As they say, Sally the camel has one hump. And when it comes to installation of this part, the camel hump faces downward. Clutches and steels should be pre-soaked with automatic transmission fluid, but sometimes it's easier to follow along what I'm doing by installing the parts dry. The order is pretty straightforward with clutch, steel, clutch, steel for a total of four clutches and the reaction plate goes on top. A snap ring on top will keep all the clutches and steel happy. We want between 25 and 35 thousandths of an inch between the snap ring and the reaction plate. If there's too much clearance, there are selective snap rings that you can use to take up more space or another steel might reduce the clearance. At this point, it really helps to line up the spline on all the clutches. We'll need to replace the Mickey Mouse washer, but this kit includes three different options. The old Mickey Mouse washer is 69 thousandths. 53 thousandths is too thin and 81 thousandths is too thick. And the third washer is a match at 69 thousandths. Let's use assembly lube on both sides of the washer before we install it. Now we're going to install. Let's also pre-lube the washer that goes on top of the Mickey Mouse washer. And the washer is in place. So let's smear an extra dab of grease across the top washer to make sure that this thing stays in place. We're finished rebuilding the input shaft. So let's move on and rebuild the third gear direct drum. And the snap-on screwdriver is just not getting the job done, so I'll try the Doyle. And the Doyle did the job and the snap ring is out. The third gear clutch pack is showing some wear and tear. So we're going to trade the well-worn four clutch pack for a six clutch pack. So the question is, how could we add an extra two clutches? The factory reaction plate clutch is on the left and is being replaced by a machined reaction plate on the right to allow for more clutch clearance. The original clutch is made of paper and as you can see, it's been burned. Fortunately, we have a much better replacement clutch material that's made of high energy semi-metallic lining GPZ. It's designed to handle friction and heat much better. We need to disassemble this drum and I'll be using a homemade compression tool to compress a spring. There is a spring compression tool that you can purchase. There are two seals that need to be replaced. If the vehicle seems a little lazy going into third gear, this might be the source of the problem. Let's go ahead and remove the seal and I'll go ahead and install a new seal after we remove the third gear direct drum bushing. The snap-on screwdriver needs a break and the Doyle is once again ready for action. And the dollar Doyle did it once again and the bushing is out. We need to install a new sleeve. The power-driven diesel diesel team has turned an old input shaft on a lathe to make a tool that simplifies the process of installing the new sleeve. I'm not going to use this tool since most guys probably won't have access to one of these at home. I'll clean up the bore with brake parts cleaner and then I'll use Loctite Green 638 seal retaining compound to help secure the bushing in place. Rapidy tap 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 and the bushing is almost fully seated just like that. Why not have a little fun with this? I'll use the old seal to help seat the new one. There's a groove inside the drum that can be used for visual reference. We don't want the bushing to fully cover this groove and fortunately it's seated perfectly. In this step of the process, you'll have to choose between two seals for your transmission rebuild. The rebuild kit includes a tech sheet for additional guidance on installing one of these two seals in the drum. A problem with this seal could prevent the transmission from going into reverse. These two seals look almost identical, but they are definitely different. The distance from the inner lip is greater with the one on the left, so I'll go ahead and use that seal. It's proven to extend transmission life. The lip goes towards the pressure. A pick really helps with installing the seal onto the cylinder. So the lip of the seal will face downward since the pressure is coming from that direction. Let's lay the seal around the drum so that we can see the lip of the seal. This will allow us to slide the seal into the groove properly and not twist it or rolled. Let's install the lip facing upward on the piston so that the lip faces the pressure. Now that the seal is installed, the piston faces downward into the drum. A generous dose of transmission fluid on all the points of contact between the inner and outer sealing areas will set up the transmission for success. With the piston facing downward and a little side-to-side -side force, the piston is pretty easy to fully seat into the home position. Let's reinstall the springs. We'll go ahead and install three springs, then skip two, and another three springs for a total of nine. I'll use the spring compression tool to put this assembly back together. The spring cover goes on first, and I'll lay the snap ring right on top. And the snap ring is fully seated, so we can remove the spring compression tool. There's a steel that goes on the bottom. Then we'll alternate back and forth with the clutch, and then a steel for a total of six clutches. We'll finish off with a reaction plate that goes on top. And a snap ring that goes on top of the reaction plate will keep everything in place. To have a good 2-3 shift with no binding, we're going to want 90 thousandths of an inch clearance between the reaction plate and the top clutch. I'll avoid rotating the screwdriver to avoid damaging the top clutch. The screwdriver will help make space for the feeler gauge blades. And the setup is very close to perfect with a small amount of tension on the feeler gauge at 90 thousandths. Let's go ahead and align the spline on the clutches. It really helps to also make sure that the clutches are centered within the drum for the assembly process. And the new bushing is well protected with a generous dose of assembly lube. The drum has been rebuilt and so has the input shaft assembly. So it's time to put them back together the way we found them. Let's remove the input shaft selective spacer, clean it up, and then apply some sticky green lube to tack it in place. We're about to install the drum onto the new billet input shaft. 
So let's go ahead and use some assembly lube on all the new seals. Now for the tricky part. I've already aligned and centered all the clutches, but there's 90 thousandths of an inch gap that allow everything to shift when I pick it up and rotate this drum 180 degrees. So I'll use my hands to squeeze down and apply a downward force on the reaction plate so the clutches won't move around. I'll try to line up the clutches with the input shaft teeth while keeping all the clutches aligned. Okay, that didn't go too well. I'll go ahead and realign everything and try it again. And a second attempt worked out fine. At this point, it's pretty critical to make sure that all the clutches are fully seated. There should be a very small gap. Let's move on to the intermediate shaft and we're going to be replacing the thrust washers. We have to first remove the snap ring to remove the planetary assembly. Removing this snap ring with the assembly in a vertical position is a lot easier, but I'll go ahead and remove it this way just to provide a better view of the process. And the snap ring is off, and I'll reorient the assembly to a vertical position to avoid total chaos from ensuing. Let's go ahead and inspect the faces of the contact points on the intermediate shaft. All the contact points look good and there's no visible aluminum transfer or damage. Let's remove the ring gear from the top of the assembly. There's no wear washer, it's actually built into the planetary. However, everything looks good with this assembly. Let's go ahead and lift the planetary up and off. There's a pin holding each of the gears in place and a thrust washer on each side. Let's go ahead and inspect each gear for excessive movement or slop. We'll try rocking each gear from side to side to make sure the internal needle bearings are still in place and in good shape. To avoid confusion, let's go ahead and place the parts back on the intermediate shaft as we go. I'll apply some grease on top of the large washer and in the path of the ring gear for lubrication and to hold everything in place. I'll go ahead and set this assembly to the side carefully and I'll make sure the planetary assembly stays on the splines. Let's go ahead and sort through the rebuild kit for the new thrust washer. The old and gold colored washer is on the left and the new thrust washer is on the right. With a generous dose of assembly lube in place, let's install the washer with the four tangs facing downward. Some extra assembly lube on top will help keep the washer in place. Let's go ahead and lift the sun shell up and then I'll reorient it 180 degrees so we can install it on the shaft. A quick spin just to make sure it's moving freely. Let's set this assembly to the side for just a minute. There's another thrust washer that needs to be replaced and this one has six tangs. This green goo is sticky as glue but it's slick as lube. And a little bit more lube on top of the washer. Let's go ahead and take apart this planetary assembly to replace another thrust washer that we can find inside the rebuild kit. The old thrust washer has a small amount of wear. The new thrust washer has been greased, so let's go ahead and align the five tangs with the slots in the planetary assembly. And the spacer fits on top of the thrust washer. I'll go ahead and place the ring gear on top of the planet. Let's secure the assembly with the snap ring. And everything is moving freely as it should. Let's make sure the load of the assembly is resting on the shaft so we can measure the end play. And the end play should be between six thousandths and forty-eight thousandths and we're within spec. Before we set this assembly aside, let's grease the faces of the contact points on the shaft. Two assemblies down and two more to go. Let's disassemble the pump assembly. I'll remove five of the six bolts. On the final bolt, I'll support the assembly to prevent it from dropping and impacting the table. I'll go ahead and I'll lift off the stator support. Let's first check the pump stator bushing. And the bushing is still in good shape. If the bushing is damaged, most people just go ahead and buy a new pump stator assembly. Let's go ahead and take the gear set out. It's a good idea to keep the parts oriented just the way they came out, just so they can go back in the same way. It's also a good idea to look for abnormal wear in the gear set before putting things back together. This bushing looks great and it's probably not necessary to change it out. However, let's do it anyway for demonstration purposes. I'll replace the seal next. It's probably had seal retaining compound applied to lock it into position. So I'll use a screwdriver to tap the seal around the edges and then I'll drive the seal out from the top side of the assembly. A few blows with the hammer and screwdriver combination and the old bushing is out. Let's clean up the bore with brake parts cleaner before we install the new bushing. I'll once again install the bushing using a block of wood and hammer. I'll seat the new bushing using the old bushing, but I don't want to go too deep since there's an oil passage that we don't want to impede. We need to stake this bushing into position to prevent it from moving. A slotted screwdriver and a hammer are the tools of choice. I'll go ahead and check the bushing just to make sure that I didn't just cause a high spot on the bushing. Let's use brake parts cleaner to prepare the metal for the new seal. And once again, the DIY Universal Installation Tools of Choice do a fantastic job of seating the new seal. A final few taps of the hammer and the seal is ready for action. Everything is all cleaned up and lubed up. So let's install the pump gear set next. It helps to line up and center the gear set within the pump assembly so that the torque converter will slide into position. I'll give the gear set a generous dose of the green goo to keep the gear set from moving out of center. Let's set the entire assembly up on boards to install the six bolts. If not oriented properly, the bolts will not line up. Let's torque the bolts to 15 foot-pounds. I'll go ahead and remove the old gasket. I'll go ahead and remove the old seal now, but I'm going to wait to install the new seal after we check for end play. I'll go ahead and replace the two seals on the pump. This is the overdrive planetary assembly, and there's one set of clutches that can only slip in reverse. 
It's pretty rare for these clutches to need replaced, and 95% of the time they are still in very good condition. Since there's an 800 pound spring inside this assembly, it can be a challenge to work with. It's a very good idea to check the snap ring. If the snap ring is broken, the kit includes a new snap ring, and it's a good idea to open up this entire assembly for inspection. Mine's in very good working order, so I'm not going to mess with it. The transmission case has been cleaned up, and it's ready for some new seals. And it's out with the old seal, and it's in with the new one. And the new seal is fully seated. And the snap ring is out of the second gear servo. So let's go ahead and replace the seal. And the pick made very easy work of removing the old seal. And the servo is back together and the snap ring is in place. I'll go ahead and replace the outer seal on the servo. On the bottom, that's a scarf cut Teflon seal that I need to size up and replace from the kit. There are several sizes in the kit, so I finally found a match and I'll install the new seal. Let's pre-lube the transmission case before we install the second gear servo. The servo is in place. If you purchased an aftermarket valve body, it probably came with a stronger spring. I'll go ahead and install the servo spring and then lubricate and install the new billet cover. To compress the spring, it helps if you can put something similar to what I'm using to serve as a lever while you install the snap ring. I've attached the spring compression lever to the transmission using the transmission pan bolts. Having a second person to assist with this step is another great option. Let's lubricate the new billet servo with transmission fluid and install it. Before we replace the low reverse servo, let's replace the seal. The lip of the seal faces up towards the pressure. It helps to get this servo started at an angle to avoid damaging the servo seal on the sharp edge of the transmission. Once the servo is in, the servo spring and the cover are pretty easy to work with. It helps to use a screwdriver for installing the snap ring. The servo lever is held in place with a steel pin. I'll go ahead and lubricate the pin with transmission fluid before installing it. The pin is installed through the front of the transmission case. Let's install the plug that secures the pin in place. I'll use thread sealant just to make sure that it stays in position. Let's install the overdrive piston support and gasket. There are six bolts that secure the overdrive piston support in place. The spec calls for 13 foot-pounds of torque, which is probably a little too much and could possibly damage the bolts. So I'm going to go with 12 foot-pounds to avoid causing damage. Let's install the low reverse sprag next. I'll go ahead and set the transmission band in position. And I'll add some transmission gel to make sure that it's properly lubricated. Let's set the drum into the transmission case. The drum should only spin clockwise. The sprag will prevent the drum from turning counterclockwise. The thrust washer kit includes a new metal washer to replace the plastic spacer. The side with the groove faces down and I'll add some transmission gel to make sure that it's properly lubricated. There's a snap ring that secures everything in place. Let's install the low reverse lever but I need to first replace the two seals on the pin. Before we install this pin, let's install a separate pin in the transmission case next to the overdrive piston support. I'll have to temporarily hold up the transmission band and the transmission band will rest on the pin once the pin is installed. Applying transmission fluid to the new seals will help protect them during the installation process. Let's get this overdrive piston assembly back together. The seals go on the outside. Let's install the overdrive piston seals next, beginning with the large outer seal. I'll have to be careful not to damage the seals during assembly or this will be a source of a transmission leak. This seal has a lip. The lip of the seal faces towards the pressure. The small inner seal also has a lip. I'll orient this lip to also face the pressure in the same orientation as the outer seal. Let's install the overdrive piston into the overdrive piston support. I'll go ahead and lubricate the overdrive piston seals and the piston support with the automatic transmission fluid. There are two pins in the piston that need to align with the holes in the piston support. This prevents the piston from spinning and damaging the seals. It really helps to use a pick to get the seal started before seating the piston. After it's installed, it's a good idea to rotate the piston from side to side just to make sure that the two dowels on the piston are seated into the two holes. Let's shift our attention to the overdrive case and remove the seal from the bottom of the case. After cleaning up the case with brake parts cleaner, I'll apply some retaining compound to the seal. And the block of wood in the hammer once again does an excellent job of installing the seal. Let's set the overdrive unit on top of a couple blocks of wood so that we can install it inside of the overdrive case. I'll go ahead and install a snap ring inside the overdrive case. It's so nice seeing this transmission going back together with all the new parts installed. It took a couple of attempts, but the case is finally fully seated and the snap ring is in place. Let's give it a spin. And this thing is definitely ready for action. Let's reorient the case with the front of the case facing upward so we can install the clutches. One of the two snap rings need to be discarded and it's the one that's wavy. The old clutch pack has five friction plates and the new one has six. I'll go ahead and I'll install the flat snap ring into the case. Let's install the new clutch pack next. Before installing the transmission clutches, definitely soak the transmission clutches in some transmission fluid. Everything is in place, so I'll install the snap ring. Let's go ahead and install the brand new Made in USA Torrington bearing from the kit next. I'll pre-soak the Torrington bearing in some transmission fluid. 
Let's install the selectable spacer into the main transmission case. This spacer makes contact with the Torrington bearing that we need to install in the overdrive case. I'm now going to transfer the Torrington bearing from the overdrive case to the main transmission case. I'll rotate the Torrington bearing to face it down to properly orient it. There's a lip on the bottom center part of the bearing. We want this lip to be facing downward. With the lip facing downward, it'll keep the bearing in position. If the lip on the Torrington bearing is facing up, there's a very good chance that it won't stay on the spacer. I'll go ahead and line up the new gasket that goes between the overdrive case and the main transmission case. Let's set the overdrive unit on top of the transmission. I'll apply some RTV adhesive to the bolts before installing them. I'll get all the bolts started before tightening any of the bolts. Let's go ahead and torque the bolts to 25 foot-pounds. Now's a good time to install the speed sensor. Let's go ahead and reinstall the T25 screws that hold on the gasket and the cover for the snap ring. Let's install the intermediate assembly next. I've already coated the contact points with assembly lube. I'll reach into the case and we'll place a hand under the sun shell as I lower the assembly into position gently. Now that everything's in place, I'll rotate the entire assembly just to make sure that everything is lined up and working properly. It's a good thing that I did rotate the assembly or it wouldn't have seated properly. This is a very common problem that people run into and this is how things should look once everything is in proper position. We're getting a lot closer to being finished and it's time to install the input assembly. It takes a lot of finesse to get everything lined up just right. There is a pretty helpful way to know when everything is fully seated. It'll make a sound like this. That's the sound we want to hear. If this isn't seated properly, it'll mess up the end play and pretty much destroy the transmission in the first 20 miles. The gasket is upside down, so I'll flip it over into the proper position. And the transmission pump is lined up with all the holes. I'll lower the pump down into position with the vent facing the top of the transmission. I'll look down into the holes just to make sure that they're lined up with the bolt holes. I'll install the seals in just a minute, but I want to first check the run out before final assembly. I've applied lubrication to the pump assembly. I'll go ahead and tighten the bolts temporarily. Let's place a dial indicator down into the transmission case so we can measure the end play. The end play should be between 34 and 84 thousandths of an inch. I'm applying a lifting force on the input shaft and the dial indicator is showing 50 thousandths of an inch of end play. The end play is well within spec. So let's pull the pump and install the outer O-ring seal. Let's go ahead and remove the pump gasket so we can install the second gear band. There's pretty much just one location that works for installing the band. I'm going to place a rag in the bottom right corner of the transmission to prevent an object from falling into the overdrive assembly. That would be a problem. On the upper right side of the case, I'll attach a new billet anchor to the transmission band. The new billet strut on the left slides into position around the tang that's on the band. Everything is in place. So, I'll go ahead and tighten the band adjuster a couple of turns so that nothing falls off. Let's reinstall the pump gasket. Before installing the pump, let's go ahead and install the seal. I'll go ahead and lubricate the seal and the transmission housing before installing the pump on the transmission. If the pump washers are damaged, you can use new ones that come in the kit. All of the pump bolts are finger tight. I'll go ahead and torque the pump bolts using a star sequence to 15 foot-pounds. Let's loosen the adjustment nut so we can adjust the band. I'll go ahead and tighten the band to 72 inch pounds. Now let's go ahead and back it off three full turns. And the band is now properly adjusted. Let's go ahead and tighten down the nut to lock the adjustment screw in place. I'll torque the low reverse nut to 25 foot-pounds. Let's adjust the second gear band next. You'll need to use an 11 30 seconds, 12 point to adjust the band. Let's tighten the band to 72 inch pounds. The manual calls for backing off 1 and 7 8 turns. However, I am using a high performance valve body and the band is going to stretch. So I'm just going to back the adjustment screw off 1.5 turns instead of 1 and 7 8 Let's tighten the nut to 30 foot pounds to make sure the transmission band stays in the proper adjustment. All this hard work is about to pay off as we're going to air test the transmission as we near the finish line. So what are these holes for? From bottom to top, the holes are third, forward, lock up and release. We only need to test the bottom two holes. One Mississippi count is perfect. If it's a one Alabama, we're gonna to have to start over. And I'm just kidding. Let's move up one hole and run the pressure test again. And that sounds good. Let's go ahead and test the second gear servo next. There you go. Yep. That sounds good. If you have like a rip seal or something, it will just collapse immediately. Let's test the low reverse servo. There you go. That sounds great. Let's test the overdrive. Let's go ahead and check the check valve by covering the hole, then pressurizing it and finally uncovering the hole. So the piston is holding air and the check valve is not stuck. Fortunately, all the air checks came out very good. So this transmission should go. be hydraulically sound. The accumulator spring on the right is a spring that came from the factory and we're going to replace it with the spring on the left. Let's install the parking rod into the transmission. This step causes a lot of DIY builders uncertainty from time to time. The parking rod will feel like it's running into a spring. At this point, rotate the transmission output shaft slowly while continuing to work with the parking rod to move it farther back towards the rear of the transmission. 
If it's installed properly, it should go in and out freely. Also, it should go past the center line of this hole. Now that we know it's in the proper position, let's rotate the output shaft a little bit more to secure the parking rod so it cannot fall out. The rod is secured and is pretty close to the center of this hole, which serves as our reference point. I'll place a screwdriver under the parking rod to hold it up while I attach it to the valve body. Let's go ahead and lay the valve body on top of the transmission and move the parking rod into position. And the clip is in place and the parking rod is secured. And the valve body is now fully seated onto the transmission. There are four long, three medium, and three short bolts. I'll go ahead and tighten the bolts to 108 inch-pounds. Let's go ahead and install the deep transmission pan assembly starting with the filter spacer. There's an O-ring that goes between the valve body and the aluminum block. I'll go ahead and torque the bolts to 35 inch-pounds. Let's install the transmission filter, which is held in place by two screws. I highly recommend changing the filter and the fluid after 1,000 miles. The clutches will shed quite a bit of material during the break-in period, and we definitely don't want the filter to become clogged. The deep transmission pan kit comes with a poor quality gasket. I'm going to switch it out for a plastic reusable gasket that will provide a lot more durability. The pan bolts need to be torqued to 10 foot-pounds. Last but not least, let's go ahead and install the neutral safety switch along with the new seal. So how exactly does a torque converter work? Will from Power Driven Diesel will explain it. We cut it open. This is called the pump. The engine spins this and it makes fluid move from centrifugal force. It goes out, then it goes down, around. It's forced in through this stator. The stator veins are controlling the flow of oil. It's giving you torque multiplication because this is spragged one way. And then that fluid is flowing into this. This is the turbine. This is what actually connects to the input shaft. So that's how it's twisting. But this is floating. It's not splined anything. Okay. It's just oil pushing on here. Mission goes into lockup. This assembly that's splined onto here when it commands lockup this applies and locks this cover to this back cover look at these hot spots on yours see this friction lining so this applies hydraulically down when it locks the converter so when it was slipping on the dyno friction was spinning on here yes the blades were still transmitting most of the torque but not all the torque was getting there because this was slipping okay so that's a single disc this has welded nuts and your new one is solid see the reason why that's bad and they have it solid because this can flex away, taking more of the load on these points, and that's why it's all hot there and bowing. And so then you have solid contact here and minimal that's yeah. not spread. That's why they make a billet cover that's solid metal. So this is a triple disc torque converter. The power goes through here. Normally this turbine section is, is attached to this. The input shaft spins in the turbine. When it goes into lockup, hydraulic pressure pushes this down and this billet plate connects to this back billet plate through the frictions. So now the engine, which is bolted to this, is coupled one to one of the input shaft. There's no slip. This is a much heavier plate, and this is a triple disc. In torque converter world, every side of a friction, they count as one disc. So this one disc applies against this floater plate. Floater plate's spline to the outside. This disc is splined to the middle or the input shaft. So that's one active disc. Then the bottom side of this applies against this. Now you've got two discs. Bottom side of this applies against this billet back cover. Three. Big difference on the back cover. They both look very similar here. However, one, this has a much bigger feed, so more oil can come out of these holes here so that it can't starve. And two, back cover, so it's way more rigid. This is thin with welded, and this is solid billet machined pieces. I was extremely pressed for time with only four days to complete all the engine mods and film the transmission rebuild. While I was filming the rebuild of the transmission over the course of a day and a half, the Power Driven Diesel team installed a transmission that was already rebuilt exactly like the one I put together. They also installed a new rear main seal and new transmission lines while they were doing the work. We've got transmission fluid in the transmission, so let's take this thing for a spin. Todd is one of the owners from Power Driven Diesel, and he wanted me to drive my truck before going for a ride in his truck. Oh, man. Now we're, now we're, Woo! All right, now we're coming. <laughs> it's alive! Yeah. <laughs> and we're at 60. So this is like everyday drive mode. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. And the smile on my face says it all. I then went for a ride in Todd's 1500 horsepower daily driver. Oh, oh my. <laughs> spin at 70 miles per hour very impressive so engine upgrades have been done the transmission's in place gentlemen what's your guess on horsepower like 485 this is the 550 package but we didn't maximize the timing and we don't know quite how high the wastegate set mm -hmm. on the turbo just within the tolerance 
My guess is four ninety five. Five hundred. I'm confident these guys. <laughs> <laughs> what was okay. the goal? I don't even know what the goal was to start with. It was at least five hundred. Five hundred okay. fifty. Yep. Oh, it's gonna make five hundred. I promise you. <laughs> That's the goal. We're gonna make it make five hundred. Five hundred's coming, baby. <laughs> the left side of the screen shows speed in miles per hour. Top center is horsepower. Top right is torque. Bottom center is exhaust gas temperature, and bottom right is boost. And the truck just made 527 horsepower and over 1,200 foot-pounds of torque. Very impressive. Before the engine upgrades, it took the truck 17 seconds to make it to 60. That's a lot slower than Grandpa's Buick. Six. After the upgrades, the truck is just way too powerful to get an accurate 0 to 60 time on slick backcountry roads. Even with a gentle takeoff, there's quite a bit of tire spin. 7.5 seconds under very little effort is very impressive and 10 seconds faster than before the upgrades. It was almost impossible to pass a vehicle on a two-lane road safely before the upgrades. The truck needed almost 10 seconds to accelerate from 40 to 60 miles per hour. After the upgrades, less than 3 seconds to get from 40 to 60 miles per hour. Very impressive! I drove just over 1,200 miles from Missouri to Utah. I averaged almost 15.5 miles per gallon driving the speed limit, which was 75 miles per hour. The axle ratio on the Dodge is a 4.1, which is very poor for higher speeds. I went ahead and threw out the third leg of the trip on fuel economy since I couldn't achieve an accurate test. Since I threw out the final leg of the trip through the mountains in Utah, it only seems fair that I threw out the results on the return trip home. Driving over the same stretch of roads, the truck did achieve close to 2 miles per gallon better fuel efficiency. Advancing the timing, better fuel injectors, and a better turbo all seem to make a big difference. Reed, thank you so much for all the work you did on the truck. What's your favorite brand of tools? So, my favorite brand of tools would probably have to be Snap-on, okay. as far as tools go. But, I mean, as you can see, I have some Harbor Freight boxes, and cool. I have one very special ratchet. Let's check it out. And I mean, as you can see, most of my ratchets are snap-on, like this, okay. and this costs about a little over 300 Okay. And this is my Pittsburgh ratchet that also costs about $302. 300 for a Pittsburgh ratchet? Are you serious? For this Pittsburgh ratchet. What makes ratchet. this fact? What, how, did you pay 300 for it? Well, no, but... The cool part with this ratchet is you can pop that off and then go ahead and count how much money's in there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's worth so much. One, two, three, three, two. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh man, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing me your ratchet. Yeah. Here, if you want to go ahead and just. Pedro, what's your favorite brand of tool? Um, I like Cap Capri tools. Capri tools? Yeah, they're Very pretty nice. good tool. All right, you got any Capri tools up here? Surprisingly, no, they're pretty much snap on and Harbor Freight. So what's your favorite Harbor Freight tool? So far, I really like these little dikes right here. Oh, yeah. So they stay nice and sharp? They're very sharp, surprisingly, but nice. they're really good. So you helped build the transmission in my truck? Yes, sir. All right, man. Thank you very much. I no really problem. appreciate it. You did an awesome job. If you had to give some advice on making a transmission last 300,000 miles, what should they do? Should you change transmission fluid or should you just drive it from day one and never change the fluid? Make sure every fluid is changed every 30,000 miles on them. All right, Pedro from Power Driven Diesel. No sponsors, no freebies, and I pay for everything. So the question is, was it worth the $10,000 to upgrade the engine and the transmission? Absolutely. I saved about $60,000 compared to buying a new truck, and in my opinion, that's a huge victory. A big thank you to the team at Power Driven Diesel. They're very professional and I greatly appreciate the collaboration. Finally, all the videos in this channel, including this one, are viewer suggested. So if you have a video idea, I hope you take time to leave a comment. Thanks so much for watching. Please take care and look forward to next time.